Yeah, I have a very specific prayer request for you. Um, for me, I am. I'm going to put this. I'm going to kids' camp this week. <laughs> and other than that lightning strike from the a few weeks ago, I don't think I've ever been more terrified in my life. Than right now. But uh, no, I'm just kidding. It's going to be great. Put a little plug in there. They're getting ready to leave and everything. I'm just be praying for our kids this week. They're there until Wednesday, I believe, and it's just going to be it's going to be an awesome experience when God's going to change lives. And just one reason I'm excited about going with them is because you, you see Jesus in the never mind the child still, and it's really it's, it's beautiful. So I'll be praying for our kids this week as they're going there, and um, yeah, just keep their minds, our leaders in mind. As we have four or five of us going. Just keep everyone your thoughts and your prayers. I just want to welcome all of our visitors this morning. Visitors, the back of your bulletins, there's a little tear-off sheet. Take a few minutes to fill it out for us. And in the service, we'll take it back to our welcome booth for you. We have a handout for you. As of right now, we're going to tune up a little bit, get going. Go around, meet someone new. Go shake some hands, meet some new faces this morning. Hey, guys. This is Peyton Neal, worship pastor at Central Baptist Church in Tyler. Check us out Sunday mornings at 945 for our small group Bible studies, as well as our 1045 worship service. If you need more information, feel free to visit us at www.centraltyler.org, or if you need more information, just check out the number here. Thank you for watching the video of our service today. We would love to see you next
nations your servant. We trust your sovereignty, but we also pray as is our right to pray for healing. We ask you to lift her up and strengthen her, give her great grace. Thank you for the courage and faith she displays as she lives this life. Blessings.
told me years ago, nothing make you hang your harps on the little design faster than a junior boys class. <laughs> nothing like being with the precious children. Now, some of them are my grandchildren, so they're perfect, but the others, you know, I don't know. It'll be a great week, it'll be a good time. But there are they are, precious. Thank you for entrusting us with them for a week. And you can thank us for the vacation we're getting this week. What a great week today. All right, let's look at the Bible. Jeremiah chapter 5. Jeremiah chapter 5, right pretty much in the middle of the Bible. Old Testament. We're studying this great prophet of God. We're studying about this time in Israel's history where this prophet arises under a good king following a bad king. A bad king led the people into terrible idolatry, awful, ungodly cultic practices, including child sacrifice. And his follower, Josiah, tries to clean it all up, and he's doing the political part, and then God raises Jeremiah to do the spiritual part, and he's trying to call people's hearts back to God. Turn away from those worthless idols. Worship the true God. And he warns them if they don't, God is preparing a powerful army in Babylon that will destroy them and tear down the massive walls of that city that they can't begin to imagine what happened, but he says it will. And they need to turn back to God. That's what the book of Jeremiah is all about. And so chapters 3 through about 9 or 10 are all sermons that Jeremiah preached at different times. They're not necessarily in chronological order, so you can kind of read through there. But these are sermons that he stood in public and preached. And I want to take a piece of one of those sermons. And if you have time, read the whole chapter 5 later this afternoon. But let's take part of this sermon, uh, verse 24 and 31, and then I'll make application. Jeremiah is preaching to the people of God and he's speaking from God's point of view. They do not say in their heart, let us now fear the Lord our God. Jeremiah 5, 24. Who gives rain both the former and the latter in the season. He reserves for us the appointed weeks of the harvest. Your iniquities have turned these things away and your sins have withheld good from you. For among my people are found wicked men. They lie in wait as one who sets snares. They set a trap. They catch men. As a cage is full of birds, so their houses are full of deceit. Therefore they have become great and grown rich. They have grown fat and they are sleek. Yes, they surpass the deeds of the wicked. They do not plead the cause, the cause of the fatherless, yet they prosper. And the right of the needy they do not defend. Shall I not punish them for these things, says the Lord? Shall I not avenge myself on such a nation as this? An astonishing and horrible thing has been committed in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely. The priests rule by their own power. And my people love to have it so. My people love to have it so. But what will you do in the end? What will you do in the end? That's a powerful message, isn't it? <coughs> I was reminded of an old story. During a fired up sermon, the Spirit impressed a great illustration on the pastor. He said, our church needs to get back to the basics. We need to become like a babe and learn to get on our knees and hands and crawl like we've never crawled before. This church needs to crawl before the Lord. As the pastor paused briefly from the back of the sanctuary, the voice cried, voice cried out, let her crawl, preacher, let her crawl. As we continue, then we need to work on studying the Word and strengthening ourselves to where we can stand and be strong in our faith. We need to stand for the Lord. Back to the sanctuary, a voice replied back, Let her stand, preacher, let her stand. Encouraged even more, the pastor continued and said, This church needs then to take one step at a time, putting one foot in front of the other until we can walk with the Lord the way we should. This church needs to walk before the Lord. Back to the sanctuary, the voice replied back, Let her walk, preacher, let her walk. By now the preacher was fully inspired by the encouraging brother in the back, spurred on by the response, the pastor continued with enthusiasm. This church needs to get into a stride where we can run for God. The first is going to take each and every member of this church, each and every one of you, to join in. You're going to have to make a commitment to time. You're going to have to make a commitment to study the Word of God daily. You're going to have to take a commitment to pray daily. And you're going to have to commit to assembling here as part of the body each and every time the church doors are open. And then and only then can this church run for the Lord. After an 
exceptionally long and thoughtful pause. A voice cried out from the back of the sanctuary in a somewhat disappointed tone. Let her crawl, preacher, let her crawl. <laughs> well, that's a kind of a Jeremiah sermon. I preached some of those. Where you call people to difficult tasks. You face them with the reality of their spiritual state and you call for change. A lot of times the people don't want to. They'd rather crawl than run with God if it's going to cost them something. In his book, Biblical Literacy, Rabbi Joseph Telushkin says about Jeremiah, the true prophet is in conflict with his times. When things are going well materially, he notes what is wrong morally. In the Bible, Stephen false prophets tell the people optimistic lies rather than the hard truths that they need to hear. For almost all of his 40-year career, Jeremiah tells the Israelites what they'd rather not hear. That God spurns their sacrifices if they're unaccompanied by ethical behavior. And that Judah's revolt against Babylon will fail and lead the to the country's destruction. They're, he hates their sacrifices. Seen that temple mount where they had this huge temple and they'd line up for hours butchering one animal after an animal and sacrifice to God. God said, I don't want to see any of those sacrifices because that's just ritual and your heart is not right with God. I'd rather see some morally pure and ethically right behavior than all those sacrifices. I thought about that when I was reading this this week because so often in today's world we talk about the sacrifice of praise. Oh, we love to praise the Lord. Bring in the sacrifice of the praise. We land the love to stand and sing and sing our praises to God. And God is saying, I don't want to hear your praise. It is not accompanied by moral, honesty, and spiritual integrity. <coughs> That's the message of Jeremiah to his people. And they say, let her crawl. Let her crawl. Most telling to me, reading this chapter, is verse 31. The prophets prophesied falsely, and the priests rule by their own power, and my people love the habits. Things were bad in it. They were as bad as they could, and the people were satisfied. They liked it that way. But Jeremiah said, what will you do in the end? Let's talk about the people being satisfied. If you have your Bible open, I want you to just look briefly at some of the case that Jeremiah makes against the nation of Judah. Some of those things we can draw parallels from in our own time. The people were satisfied. My people love to have it say in verse 31. Satisfied with what? In verse number 1, Jeremiah points out that there was not one single person living just in the city. He said, I went to and fro throughout this city looking for a just person, and I couldn't find a single person who executes judgment, who speaks the truth. That's what God said. Not one single person was doing right and living justly. But my people love to have it so. In verses 4 and 5, Jeremiah said, well, it may be just because it's the uneducated. It may be just because the people who haven't heard the truth. So I will go to the great men, the mighty men. And the commentators let us know this is the idea of the educated men. The people who have taught, the leaders of the city, the men and women who know better. And he says, when I went to the great men, I found in verses 4 and 5 that they had become fools. Even the great men had become fools before God. And then in verse 7, this is a telling thing. He says, there was a failure of the passing down of faith to the next generation. He says, how shall I pardon you for this? Your children have forsaken me and have sworn by those that are not gods. Your children have forsaken me. God says, I am angry at you, Judah, because you didn't pass down that, that, that legacy of faith that I started so long ago with Abraham and carried on through. Moses and all the great prophets and all the great kings and David and all the other men and women of God that have for centuries served God. And in your generation, you broke the chain. Your children have forsaken me. How sad my children forsake God. In verse 7 and 8, he said the people have become boldly and openly in embracing sexual sin. The, the imagery is, is quite striking there. When he said they assembled themselves like troops in the harlots' houses, they were like well-fed, lusty stallions, everyone made after his neighbor's wife. He said, but my people love to have it so. And then finally, jumping on down to verse 26 and 27, he read about the predators had been unleashed in the society. 
Instead of standing up for the powerless, the widows and the orphans, they were letting ungodly men full of deviousness and deceitfulness take advantage. He said they're wicked men who lie in wait as those who set snares. They set a trap to catch men. As a cage full of birds, so their houses are full of deceit. They can grow great and rich and fat and sleek. And, and they're surpassing the needs of wicked, but they ignore the hurting people. But no society can hold its head up in pride if a small percentage are getting wealthy on the backs of the, the helpless. If helpless people are being exploited for financial gain by the predators, the society is supposed to take action on that. But it wasn't happening. They were ignoring the plight of the hopeless. They were not ignoring the plight of the helpless and allowing people to get rich off of their suffering. God says, I am sick of this. I, can I, shall I not punish you for this? And then he said, but my people love to have it so. My people have to love it so. Now why? Why were they like such a degenerate society? Why weren't they responding to, to Jeremiah's message a couple of ideas? One, it was still a strong economy. It would still be about 20 more years, maybe 30 more years from the judgment actually came. You know, the problem, it's very hard for us to think out the future. We live in the now. It's very hard for us. If, if we get up and our bellies are full and our bank accounts have enough in it and the things are pretty peaceful, it's very hard for us to focus on things being bad and seeing that eventually those things will corrupt our society. So there was corruption going on. It was going to bring destruction. But at the moment, things were pretty good. Are you wise enough to look beyond the moment? Are you wise enough to see what continues action and continuing past will bring your family, will bring your society. If you continue to embrace immorality, can you not understand where it will lead? But it was still a strong economy and judgment still seemed a long way off. And of course, her mentality prevailed. We are meant to travel in packs. God made us for socialization. We're meant to have relationships. We travel in groups. That's the way God designed human beings. And so the problem is it's very hard to stand against the group if the group's going in the wrong way. That's why the greatest secret to raising young, good young people and keeping them out of trouble is making sure they're in a very fine youth group full of fine young people who want to serve God because they're going to be more interested in what their friends think than they are at their parents at certain times. We want them to be around good, godly kids because it's easier to follow the herd. Thank God for the wonderful young people we have that set good directions for each other. But I'm just saying, we have, find it very difficult to go against the flow. It's very hard to be the one who stands up and says, this is a bad thing to do. If everybody else says, I think it's a wonderful thing. When your soul is troubled by immorality or materialism or the, the things that are destroying our society, and you gather around a bunch of people and they say, oh, well, you're just being a negative person. You need to be more upbeat. Things are good. It's very hard to stand and say, no, this is wrong. This is a bad thing. It's wrong for us to make our fortune on the backs of helpless people or what it is that you're trying to stand against. And the third thing is, or the fourth thing, idol worship is easy. It, why were they so easily drawn to these false gods instead of the true God? Because idol worship is easy. Worshiping the true God is demanding. The living God demands a lot from us. He demands our obedience. He demands our sacrifice. He demands that we serve Him. And we don't, we don't like to do that sometimes. Calvin Miller, one of my favorite Christian writers, wrote many books. And I was listening to a tape of him this week preaching. And he said on the tape that idol worship is for people who don't really need God but want to appear religious. Idol worship is for people who don't really need God, but they want to appear religious. It's easy to embrace the idols. We lose our easy Jesus. He went on to tell a great story about easy Jesus. And he, he talked about the easy Jesus of his childhood. The Jesus he found on vacation my Bible school. He talked to a wonderful story about how that when he was a little boy, went to vacation Bible school, and he made a flannel graph Jesus. 
he was so proud of his family, clown of Graf Jesus. But at the same time, one of the tragedies of his family was, was that his grandmother was slipping into dementia. She lived with the family, and she was slipping into dementia, and she, she kind of began, you know, she just wasn't herself. And one of the things she would do is she would steal things, and she would keep them in a big old trunk she had. And she would take things from there and she put them in this trunk. And he went and got, went home. He was so proud. He's like six years old of his flannel graph Jesus. And his grandmother saw it and took his flannel graph Jesus and put it in her big old trunk. He said, Grandmother stole my Jesus. And I couldn't get him out of the trunk. He was locked in the trunk. I love that story. Grandma said, No, it's mine. But he talked about how the rest, of the, as he got older, he found that there was an analogy there that he couldn't find his easy Jesus. As he got to be a grown young person, a grown young man, and he started in into society, where was the easy Jesus of childhood, of, of crackers of punch and, and games in Sunday school? Now it was a Jesus who demanded obedience, a Jesus who demanded different style of living, a Jesus who demanded giving, a Jesus who demanded faithful assembly. And he said, I lost my easy Jesus. You know, some of you have lost your easy Jesus, but you refuse to give up the search. And instead of embracing the reality of who Jesus is, the true and the living God, you just keep looking for the easy Jesus. And so you find you an idol. You find you an idol that will make you feel a little more safer at night when the storm is coming. But really it's just a pretense. That's what Israel was doing. They had embraced it. And now they were satisfied. All these wicked things were going on in the God says that my people love to have a soap. And God was angry. Look at verse 15. God was angry with this behavior. In verse 15, he says, uh, chapter 5, 15, he says, Behold, I will bring a nation against you from afar. The house of Israel says, The Lord, it is a mighty nation, an ancient nation. And he goes on to talk about Babylon's strength that's going to come. I'm going to bring a nation against you. Verse 24 and 25. He says, <clears throat> listen, it is God who gives the rain. He gives the, and it's an agrarian society, can't function without rain. It's God who gives the rain. He reserves for us the appointed weeks of harvest. But look at verse uh, 25. Your iniquities, or your, your, what is your, a symptom of your sin, your iniquities have turned these things away, and your sins have withheld good for you. God said, I'm not going to bless you in your produce. I'm not going to bless you in your business. I'm not going to bless you in your society. I'm not going to bless you in your efforts to study. I'm not going to bless your message. Uh, and, and I'm not going to bless your marriage. I'm not going to bless anything you're trying to do because your sins have turned away my blessing. Then in verse 29, he says, How can I remain true and honest and be a just God and not punish you? Shall I not punish them for these things, says the Lord? Shall I not avenge myself on a nation such as this? Because an astonishing and horrible thing has been committed in the land. The prophes prophesied falsely, the priests ruled by their own power, and I think the love to have itself. Basically, God is saying, you know, I, I've got some standards. Have you forgotten that I rained down fire and brimstone on the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah for sins like you're committing? Have you forgotten that? Have you forgotten that I drowned Pharaoh's army in the sea because of their wickedness? Have you forgotten that I knocked down the walls of Jericho because of their wickedness and destroyed those cities? Have you forgotten how time and time again I brought judgment on, on the people who oppose it? How can I remain consistent and not judge you? I just want to ask you a personal question. Keep your poker face on. We don't want other people to know you sin. I know they all know, but let's pretend. Let's pretend. I'll go with you. Poker face on. Okay. With your poker face on, do this in your mind. Can you not remember at least one occasion in your life when something bad happened to somebody? You go, I was really no surprised that they you know what they were doing. Something said. Now, God says, if that, if I judge other people, how can I not judge you? It's odd, isn't it? Well, what has that got to do with us today? My goodness gracious, bro. Let's get Peyton back up here and let's sing. Because <laughs> that was good stuff. And you're getting me down. Because I'm 
down. All right, well, let's try that. What does it have to do? I mean, after all, the fact of the matter is, we are not Jews living in the nation of Judah. We are not living in a nation that's surrounded by the army of Babylon, which is ready to attack us. So what in the world has this got to do with us? Well, that's a good question, because the fact is, that's about, this was written, you know, some 700 years before Christ was born, five or 700 years, so it's a long time ago. A different place, a different time, a land far away. But the point is, is that the principles, the concepts, that are contained in the story, some of them certainly translate. The specifics don't translate, but the principles do. What are some of those principles that we can draw out of Jeremiah chapter 5? Number one, as a people, we can be easily led away from God. As a people, we can be easily led away from God. Oh, we love God. I know you love God. I know you love to sing to him. I know you love to pray to him. I know you love to read his Bible. I know you can never forget the day he saved you. I know you love him. I love him too. But I also know that as poor old Paul wrote Romans chapter 7, the good that I would, that do I not, and the evil that I would not, that do I, old wretched man that I am, who delivered me from this body of death. We can be drawn away from our love easily. Turn to Ephesians chapter 6 in the Bible. Ephesians chapter 6. Why is this so? Well, one is because the Christian life, if you're trying to be serious about living the Christian life, is a all-out, no holds bar, everything on the table, warfare against powerful forces. We are if you're going to live for God in any time, in any place, just talk about where you are right now. If you're going to live for God right now, it is not going to be a cakewalk. It's going to be a challenge. Why? Because there are spiritual forces that oppose, that oppose what God is doing. Just as there were spiritual forces opposing Jeremiah's attempt and Josiah's attempt to draw Israel back to God, those same spiritual forces are trying to keep Christ and his people from really being effective in this society. Ephesians 6 verse 11 gives us this teaching. Put on the whole armor of God. You don't wear armor to a sit-down banquet dinner. You wear armor to a battle. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. <coughs> We are fighting a battle against demonic forces that do not want you to serve God. I'm speaking 100% of us are fighting this battle. You may choose to ignore that the battle is going on, but it doesn't change the fact that it's going on. The only reason you don't know the battle is going on is because you are already whipped. Judging me. Well, no, I just, I, I just say, from, well, let me put it from my own personal experience. When I'm trying to serve God sincerely, I find myself in a battle. When I quit trying to serve God and just go for the flow and have a good time with society, I don't feel as bad. Well, why should there be a battle? He's already got me where he wants me. So when you, if you're not feeling a battle, you're not in the struggle. It's because you are a non-player. You are the guy sitting on the bench with the absolute white uniform when everybody else is dirty out in the middle of the field. Because you're not in the game. In fact, you kind of slid around to the other side and you're cheering for the other team. So you're not going to feel a whole lot of that. But when you make up your mind that you're going to serve God with your full heart and full soul and you're really going to put your soul into it, trust me, you'll know there's a battle. How many here know what it is to be in that battle? Maybe. Anybody got any scars? I got some scars. So, 1 John 2, 16 says it's not just, if you want to look there, it's not just the devil we're fighting. 1 John 2, 16 says, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Everything that surrounds us is, is not, it's, it's not spiritual. You can walk out there and see the spiritual and heaven declare the world of the handiwork of God. But the world system, 
is under the control of the evil one. And the world system is not trying to promote God. It's trying to do the opposite. All that's in the world, lust, the lust of the flesh, but sensualism, the lust of the eyes, covetousness, and the pride of life, pride, these things uh, are not of the Father, they're of the world. And don't we struggle with all three? We struggle with all three all the time. And so what the point is, is it's a battle. It's, it, you got to go to war. You got to say, hey, if I'm really serious, I got to understand it's going to be a struggle. And here's a powerful thought I think you can really let your mind go here. Sometimes we secretly want to lose that battle. Which both face back on. But sometimes, and not inside, not outside, if you secretly want to lose that battle sometimes. Sure we do. Some of you go, man, I am not looking forward to you. When I get to you, they they will preach and teach and it's going to be every day. And man, I'm going to have to get right with God. Some of you are excited about going because, you know, things are going well. But I've been there, I've been there, done that. Man, I got that car. I got that t-shirt. You know, G.K. Chesterton, one of the great Christian writers and apologists, there was, he was answering a question that the local London Daily Times had in their paper. And the question, it was right on the terrible times of war we want and, and they, they ask the question what's wrong with this world? You know, banner headline people were writing in answers to it. He had the shortest but most profound response. Two words. What's wrong with this world? He wrote I G.K. Chesterton. It's not my brother or my sister but it's me, O oh Lord, standing in need of prayer. What's wrong with this world? I. Sometimes we don't want to be that. We don't even want to be remembered, reminded there is that. That's why we need to hear this message from Jeremiah, because if we don't take action, we're going to find ourselves in the same mess that Israel found. Because the other principle is there's always consequences to actions. Always consequences to actions. The Bible says you reap what you sow. It just means if you do something, there's going to be an equal and a, an action that brings about an equal and an opposite reaction. You, you, whatever you do has impact. You cannot do anything without there being some uh, consequence to that action. Anything you do is going to have a consequence. And so what we do spiritually is going to have about you. You make up your mind in the morning. You get up in prayer and you say, I'm going to serve God with uh, holiness this day. And you get up and spend time in prayer and you spend time in the Bible. Before you get out into the challenges of the world, what's the consequence of that action? You're going to do better for God all day long. There's a consequence to that action. But if you skip your prayer time, skip your sermonizing time, skip your time of being with God, and rush out sleepily in the world, you're going to get kicked around. Because there's a consequence to that action. And, and just take that and multiply it in a hundred different scenarios. Anything you do is going to have a consequence. People come to me and say, I can't take this anymore. I'm going to do this. I'm going to go make, you know, I don't have God feels about that. I'm going to do that. I go, well, that solves this problem. But it, listen to me. Everything you do brings a reaction and a consequence. You can do that. But you better think down the road what's going to be the consequence of that decision you're making. Heaven's sake, the thing... <coughs> That breaks any preacher's heart, any teacher's heart, any parent's heart. It's understanding that sometimes you watch people do things that you know is going to be bad. You know it's going to be bad, right? You don't ever watch any of those shows where people ride skateboards down the post <laughs> and do stuff like that. Some of you skateboards, I, I don't know. I was watching a guy, he's, he's, he's on a, for, I don't know. They were going to jump off a small roof on, on a skateboard onto a pole and slide sideways down that pole. And they're showing him doing that on TV, and I'm going, this is not going to be good. <laughs> this is not going to be good. And sure enough, it did not turn out. <laughs> I'm insisting what I really want to say to you, but there, you, know, there, you just look at some people do things, and you go, not going to be good. Playing golf the other day and somebody teed off and hit a tree and came right 
bat. And I saw it flying right at me. I said, that's a <laughs> It. That's not going to be good, right? There's always consequences to your actions. Think about what it's going to lead. Is it going to lead to good? Is it going to lead to better? Or is it going to lead to worse? And the last thing is God wants to be the principal here. Is God wants to be your all in all. Israel was God's people. And, and, and God was not satisfied with having other loves than him. One more time, quoting Calvin Miller. The Bible is a book about people bumping into God's immensity and it refuses to play a big role in the drama of your life. <laughs> the Bible is a book about people bumping into God's immensity and he refuses to play a big role in the drama of your life. He doesn't want to be the understanding. He wants to be the Last principle. Look at verse 10 of chapter 5. There is always hope before returning to God. Even in the chapter of Jezebel, verse, there is always hope for returning to God. Jeremiah 5 10. Go up on our walls and destroy, but do not make a complete end. Don't completely destroy. Go up and destroy, but don't make a complete end. And look at verse 18. Nevertheless, in those days, says the Lord, I will not make a complete end of it. Judgment's coming. But they are God's people. And God says, I will not completely destroy you because you are my people. And there will be a remnant, and there will be a return. And I will draw you back and say, come back. That's the principle for you and me today. There's always hope of returning to God. I don't know how far you've drifted. I don't know how deep you've gone. I don't know how black things look in your life. But I'm going to tell you it's not too far. It's not too far about to be back. It's never too far. He always makes a way for the repentant heart. He always. I love Luke chapter six, uh, Luke chapter 15, the story of the prodigal son, and how that son went off and wasted everything he had and did terrible things with it. And then he comes home to the father's house, and the father, he's expecting judgment, but the father welcomes him with open arms and brings him into a feast. And, and, Luke says, this is a picture of God's heart for sinners who turn back to God. He's always ready. Well, always ready. You're always, always ready. But throw his arms around and love you. No matter what you've done. No matter what you've done. Hear me? No matter what you've done. Preacher, if you only knew, it doesn't matter. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. God's looking for a broken and a contrite heart. Oh God, He will not despise songs. So, in conclusion, look at verse 31. What will you do in the end? Jeremiah asked the people of God, that my people love to have it so, but what will you do in the end? I love this question. Now, I'll be honest with you, I'm not exactly sure how to read it and understand it. I don't know if Jeremiah is saying, what? What's going to happen to you when judgment comes? What are you going to do when the Babylon gets here? I, I don't really know exactly what he's saying, but I choose to read it this way. I choose to read it as an opportunity to start a new. What we do in the end. You know the great thing about an ending? It's followed by a beginning. What will you do in the end? To me, it means you have a chance to start anew with dedication to God. I think the question to Israel is, what will you do in the end if you, after the judgment comes, you'll have a chance to do it right this time? You'll have a chance to return to God. You'll have a chance to start anew. Will you start anew with dedication to God? I think this is the question. Or will you turn and harden your heart and move further away from Him? What will you do in the end? Some of you are facing some ends in your life. The question is, what will you do in the end? Will you start a new with fresh dedication? At least that's over. And now I have a chance to start again. Some of you had a disappointing week. What you did not want to have happen spiritually, did, and you said with self-condemnation and judgment today. Well, 
Last week's over. It's a new week. This Sunday. It's the first day of the week. Put it under the blind. Confess it. Put it behind you. And start it. Get up. Let's go again. You know, the failure of the spiritual life, I'm sure, for believers in Christ is a matter of staying down, not getting knocked down. Everybody gets knocked down. I was thinking about some times in my life when it got to be a little frustration to myself. And I was thinking the other day when God had brought me in some, some great joys in my life. And I was thinking, I'm so glad that I didn't quit. I'm so glad that I didn't give up on God. I'm so glad that I didn't give up on myself. Because I didn't think He'd given up on me. And I'm so glad that I said, you know, Lord, I'm going to get myself up. I'm going to ask for forgiveness. I'm going to get myself up. I'm going to take spiritual blood off my back and I'm going to start it. What were you doing then? If you're in, well, make it a new beginning. Make it a new beginning. Make a change. Let's stand our feet. Hi, my name's Kim Beckham. I'm the pastor of Central Baptist Church. Thanks for tuning in today and being a part of this worship service. I hope you found the message helpful and the worship inspiring. If you don't have a church home, please come check us out on a Sunday soon. If you should have any question about today's message or just want to talk about spiritual things in general, please check us out on our website and email us or call us at Central Baptist Church, 903-561-6361. So glad you are a part of the worship today. Come see us soon. God bless.